Hello everyone, my name is Dave Partner and welcome to your next tutorial on machine learning. In this tutorial, we'll treat a very interesting topic called unsupervised learning. Remember in the last tutorial, we, treat, we treated supervised learning where you tell the computer the right answers and then from the right answers you told the computer, the computer will learn to determine other right answers. Okay, um, right here is unsupervised uh, learning. And uh, my name is Dave Partner. Don't forget to like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. I will show you at the end of this video. All right. Unsupervised learning is a type of machine learning algorithm used to draw inferences from data sets consisting of input data without labeled responses. In a layman's language, this simply means gather a bunch of data and feed it into your machine learning system uh, or software. And then this software finds pattern by itself determines some sort of structure by itself all right um, for instance if you feed in a, a bunch of data of people that work in the local government uh, secretariat and all the local government staff and you feed it into your machine learning system this system finds hidden data hidden structure so the, the key word in unsupervised learning is hidden structure so in, in as much as you already know something that there are this number of males and this number of females this uh, system could discover by itself that most ladies who are married come uh, more come to work on time you understand they are more punctual to work and this is something you wouldn't have found out ordinarily by looking at the data you understand just because the data is too big too enormous you understand so that's machine learning um, that's supervised learning in you know, machine learning all right uh, there are three types not um, just three major types. You have cluster analysis, you have density estimation, and um, dimensionality reduction. These are the three basic tasks that can be performed under um, supervised, unsupervised learning. The first one is clustering. Clustering is the assignment of a set of observations into subsets called clusters, so that observations in, this, in the same cluster are similar in some sense. In a layman's language, this means it is used to form groups or clusters of similar data based on common common characteristics. So you, you feed in this data, all of a sudden after after the computer has analyzed it, it groups, it makes it forms groups of groups by itself. So it, it can group all the women who are married together, group all the unmarried women, group all the men above fifty five because they have similar characteristics. Number one is that they are above fifty five. And uh, they are all of the same religion and they are all married to one wife and you know the computer finds this structure by itself and groups them together that is clustering you understand so uh, when you're looking at your 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 data you may not find these groups by yourself but when you feed it into the computer it starts to cluster the data and find groups for you and uh, examples of where this thing is useful is in market segmentation you have your social network analysis and um, you have um, natural language and in natural language processing there are so many of them you have morphology sentence segmentation disambiguation machine translation these are places that you close you, you need computer to find um, clusters or groups of data let me give you a very good example with the number two where you have social network analysis do you know that for Facebook to um, give you the correct recommendation or the correct adverts the correct um, post on your time, your timeline, your news feed. They have to check so many things, and um, those, these things are, for instance, um, they want to check all the the, the category of the, the news or posts you've commented on in the past, the category of people in your people you communicate with in your chat or messages, and uh, the category of pages you like. It forms a cluster with it so any other data that falls into that cluster it can recommend it to you so if somebody makes if you usually comment on religious posts it means you like stuff about religion so if something somebody else makes a, a post on religion it reflects on your timeline this guy is already your friend and the post he, he makes falls into a cluster in which you are interested in all right and um, it, it, they can form clusters of you and your friends, your friends who school in the same school with you, clusters of your friends who are in the same church group with you, 
So if any one of those friends in that church group does something, they can recommend it to you because you're interested in that group because it falls into your cluster. All right. Um, um, the next one is a cocktail. Uh, let me just show you a random problem or a big problem in this field. And um, it's, it's worth knowing that just our, that's why I just want to mention it. It's called the cocktail party problem. So it's, it's very important that anybody that is passing through this topic knows what it is, at least for the knowledge, for the record. So, but before then, I want to read you a poem I wrote two, three years ago, and uh, here is it. Um, it reads, I can shut my ears without ever covering them from sound. I choose what I see, but all the time I look around. The happiness of a soul is in the realization of the choices abound. All right, I wrote this and um, I want to use it to explain what the cocktail party problem is. When, um, here is the cocktail party problem. The cocktail party problem, party effect, is the ability to focus on a specific human voice while filtering out all other voices or background noise. All right, so um, what it simply means is you're in a cocktail party and um, you're, Usually there are lots of people talking at the same time and people in, in clusters and are discussing, you know, and um, you and someone is talking to you, you want to focus on the person that is talking to you, although you're hearing all other human voices all around discussing separate things, uh, but, but you are able inside your mind to put your focus of concentration on the person that is talking. Um, the ease with which human humans perform this trick belies the challenge that scientists and engineers are faced with reproducing it synthetically you know scientists have been working hard to see if they can get a computer to focus on one human voice even if it's seated in the inside or inside a party hall or in a noisy environment this problem has been there since the 1950s when pilots coming into the um, into the uh, when pilots communicate with the, the, the people at the control tower using a microphone all right. Um, when so many pilots come calling, making calls um, to the control tower, usually causes a problem. The guy sitting there is really confused because all the noises, all the all the voices are coming in, and um, it's so it's such a big problem. And knowing uh, which one to focus on. All right. But the human mind does this very easily, and scientists have been working hard to see if they can get it um, to be performed by computers synthetically. Let me just show you an example. So here is a, a big example. We are in a, a particular room, and um, we are in this room in a party, and there is a a speaker here, and there is a speaker here, and then there is a recording device here, and there is a recording device here. All right, so these two speakers are talking at the same time. These guys are talking at the same time. As you can see, the distance from here to this recording device is shorter than the distance from this one to this recording device. So when we finally, uh, when these two devices have finished recording, I will finally pick this device out and we'll play the voice, the recording. You will see that. There are two voices talking, but one is louder than the other. You understand? This is how they, they do it experimentally. So you see, uh, you hear two voices talking. One is talking at the background, and one is talking on the foreground. So the challenge for the computer is to be able, the algorithm, is to be able to filter out, since this is the one we want to listen to, can it, can it remove this guy from the picture so that uh, from the audio recording, we'll hear only this guy? You get now, so uh, when we get to the audio recording, we just hear one guy talking. So that's the, that's the problem for computers. Can computer be able to filter out all the other human voices in the in the recorded audio and pick out only the ones you need? All right, so that's the uh, the standard cocktail party problem. So when you get back to my poet poem. You find out that that's what I'm talking about here. I can shut my eyes without ever covering them from sound. So um, you can see that uh, it's a thing I discovered in my mind that I can do it inside my mind. So you can always check out the poem later. 
So um, the next question is the construction of an estimate based on observed data of an observed unobservable underlying probability density function. So in um, to give you a, a good example of this, I will first of all give you a good example of um, clustering. So we have something like this. Um, maybe we have this graph and um, Inside it, we have these plots of um, cluster your group of friends who school in the same school with you, and your group of friends who are in the same church with you, and uh, your group of friends who like what you like, the pages you like. So, if you notice in a, a typical social network, um, some of some of these will. This is how the the data will be grouped at the background with the, with the machine learning algorithm and um, so it, they can make the correct recommendations for you or, or put you in clusters where you um, fall into so this is what the clusters may look like and uh, but for density they want to know um, how many what was the relationship here so to give you a good example of the density what you have is if we put all these all these if, if we map them onto a straight line single straight line what we'll have is if all these dots are brought down onto a straight line we can have dots here um, um, let me just call it this so you will see that we have so many dots on this straight line um, so many somewhere then you will have few for this guy, if we draw all of them down, we have so many again, so many, so many, so many, so many, so many on this line. Then for this one, we have so many again, but then for here, we have few, so we have very few dots here. Then we have so many, so many, so many, so many of them. So in density estimation, what we're trying to do is, um, if we decide to draw a line, that um, depicts the number of dots. We just see that when we we'll come here, we we'll say, "Oh, it's big." Then here is small. Then here is big. Then here is small. And then here is big again. And then it's like that. All right. So um, we're estimating the density of each of these clusters. Okay, that's what density estimation is all about. All right. So in the next. Um, the next is the process of reducing the number of random variables under consideration via obtaining a set of uncorrelated principal variables. It can be divided into feature selection and feature extraction. Um, to really explain this in a layman's term, um, what we have, assuming that we have data, um, it's difficult to draw, but uh, let's say we have more than one feature. Usually, if we have a single feature, what we would have is um, um, these guys, these data points map to these values. You understand? So, but then that's a feature. Maybe here could, could be height, and uh, here could be weight. Well, what if we have something like eye color? Maybe we're checking the, the eye color of the, the person or the, the humans under consideration here. How do we represent this third feature? So if we have only two features, it's quite easy. But when we have a third feature, you see that R has moved into um, 3D. We need a three dimension um, to represent the feature. So we need something that is sort of in, in three dimensions to represent the feature. We need something like this. To represent what we're talking about so the more the more the arrow increases the more you need um, more dimensions to to really represent what you're talking about properly and um, that constitutes a problem which we mentioned in the start of this tutorial when there is a, such a problem you for simplicity sake you would just need to reduce um, the number of features to what you can use you understand something like this we could map it out into a single line and um, see if we can translate it into a single line all right 
So we'll try and um, translate it into a single line. That's what dimensionality reduction is. We reduce the dimensions to what we can work with, something that is quite easy for us to, to work with. Um, you may call it something like composite key. What if we, we have this H and W, and um, we call it a third feature called A, and that A contains our H and uh, our W. So it becomes one key right now. As you can see, if we do it like that, we've reduced it to one. Then we can work. We can work with the third feature, which we reduce it to only two features. So that's what dimensionality reduction is. How many of the features can we com combine to form one feature so that we can work with it um, with the rest? All right. So um, thank you very much for this um, opportunity to um, complete this particular section. And uh, don't forget to like, subscribe. Um, to my YouTube channel, just visit youtube.com slash c slash brain term and click on subscribe. Facebook, subscribe, and um, Instagram. I'm on Instagram all the time doing business video tutorials. And uh, I'm on Twitter. And also um, watch the next video tutorial because this is a series. Thank you very much. See you in the next one.